dreaming of what could happen in your life, your marriage, your work life, your business, your church, what could happen if we actually get a hold of this? that the sum is greater than the parts. When you and I connect together, something similar but much more powerful takes place. What could we accomplish? I tell you, there's no limit to what we can do if we do it together. Revival is something that is experienced together. It's something where the Holy Spirit is poured out on a church or a city and people are experiencing it together. Revival is not an individual experience. Revival is something that connects us powerfully. Come on and stand to your feet. Let's go, Gateway.
room with your praise, all your adoration, lavish your love on you. Come on, let the room, let the room be filled with our praise. Oh, every inch, every foot of this room, we dedicate this to you, Lord. We lift you higher, higher, higher. Exactly what we live for. We live for moments to be in His presence and experience His power and His goodness. And as we were singing that song, the Holy Spirit spoke to me healing is the children's bread. Healing is not hard, healing is not far away. It's the basic provision of a good father for the children that he loves. So right now, if you need healing in your body, I want you to lift your hands and just receive your bread. Just take your bread right now. Healing is, everybody say, this is my bread right now. Thank you for my bread, Father. Thank you for my bread, Father. Thank you for feeding me. Lord, I speak to every sickness. I speak to every illness, every injury, every affliction of the enemy. Lord, we break its power in this moment, Lord. For in your presence, Lord, there is healing this morning. And I thank you, Lord. It's not old age, and it's not the consequence of this or that. Lord, I thank you that you are a healer and that you drive out sickness and disease from the midst of us. By your stripes, we are healed, Lord. We receive it right now. Thank you for the bread. Thank you for the bread. Thank you for the bread right now. We receive bread, Lord, we receive. And Lord, I thank you for peace, crushing all anxiety. We're not going to be afraid of the future. We're going to be bold, filled with your boldness, Lord. Healed and filled with boldness, Lord. And nothing shall by any means harm them. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Hallelujah. Everybody just say, Jesus, we love you. We love you. We love you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Pastor, Pastor Greta, Frank, come on up. Hallelujah. We don't want to obscure you. We're going to introduce you in just a minute. But uh, good morning. You know, 
I really felt like the Spirit was saying that we heard about the new wine, that God is saving the best wine for the end like he did his first miracle in Cana. He's saving the best for last. So get ready. God's about to pour out upon us the best wine. Get ready to receive it. If you need to empty out so that you can be filled today, God wants to fill us. Amen. Wow, what a conference this has been. And, whew, yeah. <laughs> and I'm almost sad that it's coming to an end, but at the same time, I'm excited because it's time to step into what God has for us. Amen. Yes, I'm excited about the best. So this morning, we're going to have our very last icebreaker. And uh, before we do that, I want to ask you, Frank, what was your favorite part of this conference? Well, if you've been here all the last few days and you didn't hear God speak, you missed something. God was speaking. And I have a quick testimony about, you know, kind of a funny one. Greta can be a bit um, germophobic, just, just a bit, just a bit. She dropped her toothbrush twice, twice. That would have sent me out at midnight to get a new toothbrush. But no, she's, she's felt the healing. She's, she's received and she washed that toothbrush off and went right to it. So that and the other thing is the prophetic word it is it has been amazing if you missed it you've got to watch it on online because it has just been fantastic and if you didn't receive it something's wrong i want you to see pastor jordan after church and let him fire to your foot we just want to test you to see if you feel all right so we're going to give you a chance you're going to stand we're going to do this quick because we want to get to that new wine but i want you to turn to someone tell them your name tell them where you're from and i want you to share your very best memory from the conference something god spoke to you something that you received and uh do it quick Well, I can tell you all are excited, had a good time, but we're going to press forward. This morning, we have the privilege of honoring generations. Anyone who's working with generations, we want to honor you. In fact, look at that total. Out of our campuses, 122 people are ministering. Thank them. Bless them. I want you just to stand. If you're working with uh, children and you're anywhere from the nursery all the way up to young adults, I want you to stand. We want to honor you. I want to say briefly that...
The world says that it takes a village to raise a child, but I believe it takes a church. And I'm in the ministry today because of some wonderful, dedicated people who taught me when I was a rebellious young child. In fact, there's one uh, woman who stands out in my mind. Her name was Thelma Fitzpatrick. She was a cantankerous woman who came from Alabama, and she would kind of smack us if we were noisy, but she put something into me. She instilled in me that church is the best thing happening. We had fun. I had a dream to be a stewardess. That obviously was not in the plans. But she started at our church, Jet Cadets. And maybe you've never even heard of that, but it was like the Christian version of being a flight attendant. And uh, I had the little hat, and I learned the scriptures and got little, <laughs> little badges to put on my hat because she cared about my eternal home. And she invested in me, so thank you. You may be feeling like you're doing a thankless job, but it has eternal benefits. So thank you, we love you. All right. We're gonna come and stand next to this man. Like I said, we've saved the best for last. He's the icing on the cake and his his bio reads like the who's who of Christendom, so forgive me if I need some cheat notes to read this, but Dr. Frank DiMaggio has been in ministry for over 40 years, longer than I've been alive. <laughs> I'm, oh, God, forgive me. As a college professor, a church planter, the lead pastor of a multi-site church, Bible college president, and the chairman of a fellowship of churches, of which we are honored to be part of. Frank's a graduate of Portland Bible College and he has a Master's of Divinity and a Doctor of Ministry from Oral Roberts University. Wow. He's authored over 40, 30 books, 10 more are coming. He's, he's, that was prophetic. He's, he's, he's presently devoting his full-time ministry to doing just what he's doing here, mentoring, pastors mentoring churches. He is uh, running Frank DiMaggio Ministries through creating web resources, providing leadership coaching, presenting leadership intensives, whew, and writing new books. Another 10 are on the way and speaking nationally and internationally. It is my great honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Frank DiMaggio. Give him a big welcome. I'm gonna have that couple travel with me just, just to introduce me, just, just, uh, just to really frame in who I am and to prophesy my future, my writing, what I'm gonna do. Why do you pray when you have people can just tell you what you're gonna do, you know? Well, sorry about last night. Complicated, complicated. You would have thought I was trying to fly to Afghanistan. Um, I, w I have with me my uh, wife, would you stand, Sharon? She now travels with me more than she would like, but uh, it's dangerous to send me out on my own. I could end up in Afghanistan. So, uh, but it's great to be here. We finally got here, and then we're here today. And, and uh, I want to uh, thank David again for the invitation and the leaders, David and Kathy, and all the team. I always enjoy coming here. I was just here, it seems like, a few days ago. Um, uh, and I, I honor uh, David and Kathy and the elders and the team and the staff and all the people because you're, you're building a great church. And uh, it's great that David has a strategic layered process thinking pattern so that when he plans things, they're uh, detailed and they're progressive. And I think what he's doing with the church right now, even this conference, is a great idea. Uh, it's something that we did for forever on trying to gather all the leaders from all the campuses. And we, we did it twice a year, four days each with our retreats. And that was how we kept everything together. It was really that bonding, prayer, uh, teaching, et cetera, that really allowed all the campuses to really merge and function together as one team, which you're trying to do with your 10 City Vision. I think the 10 City Vision... Uh, is uh, the name and the brand of what you need to do, but it's not limited to 10 cities. I uh, just want you to know that. 
uh, since she since she's told me I'm going to prophesy and and write ten more books, I'm going to tell him he'll get the ten cities and then he has to do ten more. <laughs> so I just I just thought I would lay that that on you, you know. Um, but honestly, great leader, great team, great everybody. It's good to be with my father in the faith, Apostle C. Uh, he had uh, <laughs> profound, profound man of God. Honestly, uh, top five men of God I've ever known in my life is sitting right here. Uh, and I've known him since I was 17. I'm 68 years old, and he's 176. <laughs> and so... Uh, And uh, he's had influence on us, our family, our church, our ministry. And thank you, Apostle Steve, for being who you are, man of integrity and prophetic. And you, you, you set the, the path for us young guys to try to get onto it. And, of course, I'm with my, my twin brother, Eric Butler. Uh, <laughs> Eric and I, you know, I, I knew last night that he would, he would preach, teach, prophesy, and then sing, and then start all over again. <laughs> Me, you know, five talent, three talents, one talent, ten talent, all that. I teach. <laughs> if he teaches and it doesn't go well, he starts singing. <laughs> I can't do that. And then if that doesn't go well, he starts moving and prophesying. Then on to healing, and <laughs> Eric, you're my man. You're, you're honestly one of my best friends and um, has had profound impact on my life also. And uh, I love his church, love his team. And I didn't even know you were going to be here. It's a surprise. Uh, it was God that I couldn't fly in last night so you could preach. You know that, you know. And that's what you will tell people as you travel now. <laughs> All right, because I missed last night, uh, obviously I had two sessions with you, now I have one, and I've already meandered a little bit, but uh, you know, I thought I should. Uh, I'm gonna jump right in, and I'm gonna motor right along. And so if you are a note taker, I would suggest you get out your pen and paper and put a motor on your pen, <laughs> and, and get ready to think with me about this subject that we're gonna deal with this morning, and try to at least impart the spirit and heart of this subject. I'm going to talk about what it means to be a game changer, and uh, I'm going to define game changers, and I'm going to give you some uh, research and definitions within our frame of thinking about game changers so that we can all enter in. This message is for you. Uh, I'm going to start with game changers are church changers, uh, because that's what this is. This is a church conference, and everything about us, we are game changers for the church, in the church, through the church. That's That's our heartbeat. I mean, we could, uh, there's many other uh, operations of the kingdom of God, but right now we're talking church. Ephesians 3, uh, verse 10 and 11 describes one of our famous scriptures. His purpose was that now, everyone say now. now. Uh, so the church is a now church, through the church. Everyone say through the church. Uh, another translation says he will use the church mightily. Another one says it's, it's the means for the purpose to become reality. And so the purposes of God found in the covenants, Old Testament, and all the way through to the New Covenant, all the way through to the prophecies and the promises and the New Testament theology, the church is called the eternal purpose of God. So there's, there is no second chance for humanity. The church is the first chance. And so the church is God's first plan. The church is the eternal purpose. The church is what God is doing. It's a time manifestation of an eternal idea. And so the church has been manifested, and it's gone through a few thousand years since Jesus said, I'll build my church. And it's gone up and down, in and out, and it's had its uh, different ages and era and time and uh, all that's happening right now. In the world, the church is doing quite well. And uh, in America, even though people kind of have their opinion about the church, uh, the church, in my estimation, I do travel, that's all I do, uh, I would say the church has some um, movings of change and some um, great leaders coming up, another generation of leaders that are uh, really going to be amazing game changers uh, as long as they get their theology right. They will be amazing to do 
what they're going to do because they have gifts, they have talents, they have charisma, they have ideas, they're creative, they have it all. Uh, but with it all, you still need the thing called the boring Bible. And so with that, you, you want to change society, you want to change the culture around us, and to do that, you've got to be a game changer. Now for you, this is what I'm saying, a game changer, number one, we are called to this great privilege, okay? You and me, all of us, there's not just a calling that goes out of a few people. Uh, game changers are called to the purposes of God to build in the greatest thing of all, the church. And so that's your calling, that's my calling too. We're privileged, we are absolutely privileged to champion the cause of the local church, be involved with the local church, raise our kids in the local church, train leaders in the local church, plant churches, send missionaries, do multi-site, take the Bay Area all the way around the whole valley. Why? Because the will of God is to have many more healthy churches in this valley. Uh, sick churches don't help a sick culture. Healthy churches help a sick culture. And so we need healthy leaders to have healthy churches to help a sick world and a sick culture and all the sicknesses out there, and that's our privilege. Uh, we are third responsible to uplift the view of the church and to live that view and to speak well of it, to build it, to be involved, be faithful for the next generation as they watch you. We're responsible. And fourth, we're needed to use our unique gifts and talents. Okay, you're needed whether you feel it or not and whether you want to excuse yourself or not. You're needed. Every specific gift in the body of Christ is a needed gift. There's no wasted gifts right. in the book of That's Corinthians. Right. They're all needed gifts. Every right. gift is a needed gift. Every person, it says in Corinthians, is placed in the body for a reason. And so if you go your whole length of thinking there, then you'll say, well, what about the people who are uncomely and the people who are ungifted and the people that are broken, dysfunctional, and we got to carry them across the line? Paul says they are needed. He, he reads your mind. He says, and they're needed too. Why? Because they help you develop compassion and patience and other things. They help you understand the value of humanity is not in the gift, but in the creation. They help you to understand something about basic theology and people. We don't just serve the gifted. We serve everybody. We don't just elevate the real charisma gifted person. We elevate because we're in the body. We're part of the body. We're part. We can serve. I might not be able to do much, but maybe what I can do is I can be the best cafe worker that's ever been in the world. I can be the best children's worker, and I can impact families as they come into the church. The pastor may never see you impact those new families, but a good children worker, they're meeting those new people. You're showing that love. You're talking to that young mother, that young couple, and you're, you're actually a bridge to the church more than one of the elders or more than one of the pastors. Why? You're an important part of the body of Christ. And so your gift is needed. I know you know that. Now, here's five groups of game changers, five groups of game changers that I think every church will have or should have, Ephesians 4, 11, and 12, what I would call the fivefold ministry, which for us, we would understand fivefold ministry. Every church should have them or have their input. You might not have them uh, resident, but you don't have to have them resident. They need to have input. They need to have impact. They need to be respected. As, as he brings in myself, the kind of an apostolic teacher and, and Apostle C, apostolic, and Eric is a prophet. And, and so David understands that. So he brings in fivefold ministry. You're a blessed church. Some churches are only built on the one person that preaches all the time. And then he brings in only people that are just like him. And so the body never gets to actually ever see a prophet or an apostle or an evangelist or a real teacher. It's a blessed thing to be in a church that elevates the fivefold ministry. And, and the fivefold ministry are game changers. I think the... Uh, Servant leadership culture uh, takes in just about everybody in the culture here. The servant leadership culture is, is when the whole church finds themselves serving, everybody's involved. And then the worship culture. I'm giving you five groups that I think can be really game changers in the church. There's more, but I see these as the cheap ones. The worship culture is what builds the personality of a church. The pastor is the roots, and the pastor has a shaping power like a wave breaking upon the shore, but the worship is every week, and people will come back to the church sometimes 
for the worship, not just for the preaching. And, and not that the preaching's bad or good. They don't understand everything in the Bible, but they understand the feel of presence. They understand the feel of God. They, they come in and they cry. They don't know why they're crying. They come in and they get touched. They don't know why they get touched. They, they don't know anything about the Bible yet. But the worship culture are game changers because they're presence-driven, and they understand presence to uh, flow in that service, which you guys do very well. The creative teams are the others that I think many churches are just now catching on to, but they're a big deal. Yeah. Your creative people are a big deal in your church. And usually the creatives right now are the younger group, and there's a reason for that because of their upbringing and all their knowledge and what they're getting. But the creatives are the people who connect the culture. They can connect brand, they can connect communication and, and podcasts, and they can take over the pastor's Twitter and Instagram, make sure he upgrades, and so that when he texts something that doesn't look like it's from the 1800s, uh, or Instagram pictures that, the, you know, the millennials and 39 are looking and say, that's a weird, that's a weird guy, you know? <laughs> what in word is he talking about, you know? And so you need the people that understand brand, and they understand digital, and they understand color, and they understand upgrade, they understand culture, they understand everything about what they're doing. I have a guy that does all of my my social media because my son finally uh, demanded that I give it up. Uh, the, the last picture I took of myself, I, I was laying on my desk and I took a selfie like this. And my, my son said, that's it, that's all. You can't send another one. I said, I, I got 27 likes with that picture. I mean, What's wrong with that picture? It was interceding. It was, it was, it was, it was great picture. You know, now, you know, I get hundreds of likes on my Instagram. I have people ask me when I travel, hey, who does your social media? I mean, it's not you, is it? <laughs> it could have been. But I chose to give myself to a higher calling. You want people that understand these little green lights up here. Yeah. Might not mean anything to you 40 and 50 and 60 year olds. Might even irritate you. Why do we have the little green lights? Because they're cool. Yeah. Why are they cool? Because they are. Yeah. Well, who defines cool? Not you. Yeah. Now, if you, if you only want to reach the 50 and over, then you do Pentecostal 50 and over services. But if you're going to reach a culture that doesn't understand God or Bible or Holy Spirit or anything else, and they're young and they're hungry for the reality of God and hungry for community, then you're going to have to kind of have the creative take over. Let them have freedom. Let them, let them define even some of the, the series that you preach, even some of the titles. My titles look like book titles. And then they said, Pastor Frank... Can, can we change the title of your series? I said, you're, you're, talking, you're talking now stuff that is inspired by God. <laughs> I mean, how, how, can, how can you better what I'm doing? And so then I used to make my own slide backgrounds. As you can tell, this is one of mine here. Uh, and they said, let us do your slides for now. You just don't even worry. I said, well, you know, I have a... a feel for what I'm saying. <laughs> and so they made three slides for this one series. They said, here's three backgrounds. Which one would you choose? That one. OK, let's put it out to 150 of the staff <laughs> and let everybody just say, which one? I said, great. I said, you guys are going to be shocked how talented I really am. <laughs> You know, God be my witness, not one person chose my slide back then. Not even one. And the one that they said, this will be the one people are like, I said, I hate that slide. It's confusing, it's busy, it's, uh, you lose the message in the picture. That's what you're supposed to do, Pastor. I don't like that. Well, I had to let go, let go, let go. Why? Because creative people are gifted. And if you can get them at the right age, they are gold for your church. I mean gold from the entry to the coffee smell to the lights to the feel. I'm just talking. 
This is not super spiritual stuff like today. Well, is that how you build a church? No, you build a church with the word and the spirit and prayer, but you need to have people there to do that with. Yeah. By the way, you need to have people there to do that with. And sometimes we do that with the same people over and over and over and over and over for 10, 20, 30 years, the same people over and over. And someone says, do you not think we could get some new people? No, we're going deep. <laughs> we chose deep, not broad. Well, David hasn't. David has chosen broad. And David's heart and Kathy is to reach people. And to reach people means you got to give in a little bit. All right, the, the fifth group is the business group. I'm going to talk about them. Uh, but the marketplace group is a very important group in the church, and they should be, they should be uh, identified and trained and released and talked to and helped because your marketplace people can become your greatest evangelists. Now, let me go to the next section here. That, that would have been one session, but you just got one session called Reader's Digest Version, okay? <laughs> now, here's the next one on characteristics of Game Changer. All right, I'm going to ask you a question. You're going to write it. You're not going to answer. I'm just going to keep teaching. But I want to ask you the question, where are the game changers? Who are the game changers? And the most important question I'm going to ask you is, are game changers born that way? Do they have a special secret code in them that makes them a game changer? And if you don't have that, if you're not born with that whatever it is, you can't become a game changer. I'm asking you the question. How are game changers made if they are made? Are they born? If they are born, how, what happened to the believer's birth? And then how do, you, how do you actually recognize a game changer? How do you train them? How do you become one? Some people think they're game changers, but they're only game observers. They never get in the game. But they are really game analysts. It's like when you watch... When you're watching sports and you make the call from the couch when the rep is two inches from the call and you say, that's a stupid call. I can't believe that. He should have, or the quarterback, why did he pass? Why didn't he go around the end? And you're calling plays and talking like an idiot. <laughs> you're not a coach. You're not a rep. You're not even, you're not in the game. If you were on the bench, they would pack you up and send you home. You are not, you, you just like to analyze everything. Analyzers don't get involved. Right. And if you're not careful, you become an analyzer, then a criticizer. Right. And if you're not careful after you're a criticizer, then you become kind of a bitter criticizer right. because right. nobody will listen to you. Nobody should listen to you. God doesn't listen to you. All right? Uh, true. It's true. That, was, that wasn't a joke. That was the truth there. All right? Some people are game killers. If you put them in the game, the game dies. You put them in the game, and all of a sudden the game goes south. And, and I do wonder sometimes, why do you put that guy in the game? He's one for 13 at the three-point. He's one for 13. What are you trying to do? Make sure you can fire him after the game? Or, you know, I, sometimes I don't understand it, so I wonder why they let a game killer kill the game, but maybe the game needs to be killed because they couldn't win any bit way, and so they let all the guilt come on the one guy who they don't care about. Okay. <laughs> Possibility. <laughs> All right. Here's five levels of game changers. A game changer would have these five levels. Self changer, place changer. Go ahead and put them all five up. People changer, culture changer, church changer. Now, if I want to be a church changer, I got to start with self. A person who doesn't know how to change themselves, they will never change anything else. And so really game changers are people who are so magnificent at discipline and transformation and, and renewing of the mind. They change themselves. They don't try to change everybody else. They try to change themselves. So if you're a game changer, they want to be a game changer, how are you? Are you transformation right now? Are you you know, doing the discipline thing. And then you begin to change people. You can't change people if you can't change yourself. A leader who tried to get people to change in a small group, and you're talking to them, you really need to tithe. You know, the church needs your tithe, but you don't tithe. Or there's going to be an offering. Yeah, you know, it's a great thing David brought this up. We're going to take an offering for the house, and we're going to give. But you don't give. 
And you know, the prayer, the, he's calling everybody to the prayer and we're going to do a prayer. But you don't go. I'm talking about a person who can only influence people from their mind, not from their example. That is called a bad leader. That is called a leader who will not shape people. People will not follow that leader. They sense after a while you don't have it. Okay, a self, a place, what is a place changer? A place changer is simply this. Wherever you put them, they change the atmosphere of that place. If you put them in any ministry of the church, the ministry gets better. Have you ever put some people in ministries and the ministry gets worse? Or people start quitting, they won't volunteer. You, you put them in the children's ministry and all of a sudden there's no volunteers. Say, what happened here? I put you into that place. Well, they, they're a place ruiner. They're, they're a place, they're, they're, they, they take authority wrong. They take people wrong. They don't have the skills, they, whatever it might be. But if you're going to be a, a game changer, you have to have a certain attitude, a certain aptitude, a certain character, a certain servant spirit that wherever you serve, and by the way, serving has really nothing to do with your gifting. Whoever taught that should be hung in heaven. <laughs> because then you have people waiting. I hope you didn't teach that, David. No. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. Why? Because you teach people to be lazy and to be cherry picking. And, you know, the guy who says, well, I have a teaching gift. Stack the chairs. No, I teach. Give me a small group and I'll smoke it. Make me stack chairs and you are, you are ruining a great gift for the king. Why don't you help with the children? Don't have a gift for children. Nobody has a gift for children. It had nothing to do with gifting. All right, you get my point. Servant leadership serve anywhere and change where they serve and they always make it better. If they're a game changer, you can give them anything, and in a few months you go, wow, what in the world happened there? Oh, yeah, that's him. He's a game changer. He's a place changer. Put him anywhere. Put him in the cafe. Doesn't know anything about cafe? Cafe is better. Put him with the youth, and he's too old to be with youth. He's 40 years old. He should be with youth. All the youth love him. He's doing great. He trains the team, and when he leaves it, it's better than it was. A game changer first changes wherever there's a need that needs to be served. And that's you, that's this group. I'm preaching to the choir. You're already that way. And then you become uh, a culture changer and ultimately a church changer. Now, there are game changers in these six levels that everybody would recognize. These are six areas in our culture that we would say, oh, a game changer. I got it. Here they are. In sports, well, we could go a long ways to talk about all the game changers in sports. There's, there's a bunch of them. And uh, if they are involved, they, and they're called game changers. Second is business. And we just lost the great one up in the Northwest, Paul Allen, but there's all kinds of business. There's some people that just change everything. They're amazing. They're complicated. They, they have a game-changing mentality. Where did they get this? The third is politics. I think I'll skip that one. Um, <laughs> Game changers, where are they? I think uh, one would be Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. <laughs> Winston Churchill. <laughs> World missions. Most of the kingdom of God, great game changers are in that circle. Honestly, they're in the circle of world missions. Uh, so many great game changers. Five is leadership, and leadership being both secular and church, and six, the leadership team, all right? Now, you can be a game changer because you're on a game changing leadership team. Even if you aren't yourself a game changer, you can be a game changer if you are a team player and you get onto a team and the team is a game changing team. You might lack what it takes to maybe be the front guy or the front gal and, and push everything and do everything and have all that charisma. But on that team, you add so much to it, the whole team becomes a game changing team. And I think in churches, game changing teams are much more real than game changing individuals. You might only have a few, but you don't need a bunch of game-changing individuals if you have a bunch of teams that are game-changing teams. And so you bring your gift to the table and you use it. All right, here's my definition of a game-changer. A leader who dramatically changes the way that something is done, thought about, or strategized. Now, every one of you, campus pastor, campus leader, worship, children, youth, uh, creatives, every imaginable category sitting in front of me here, 
you have the chance to do something different with where you are serving. Don't become the routine person who only extends what always has been. Don't just sustain what has been. A sustainer is not a game changer, although you don't want them to tear it up, but you have the ability to actually bring change and thought and difference to the area that you're serving in right now. And you can go outside the box and you can do parking lot different. You can, you can print your own t-shirts, give them to your team and say, this is what we're wearing today. David's not gonna care unless it's a rude something on it, you know, or, or don't follow David. That would be a, a you know, kind of a, a, a bad t-shirt to hand out. But if you have a team and you're developing that team, think about what you could do in your area that nobody had done before with children, with youth, with teaching, with small group. Small group is, is open, I mean, from here to the moon, it's open. And so creativity and new thought, but just don't take an area and only do what someone else had done. Take an area and begin to pray and begin to look and begin to think and begin to add. And before you know it, you're doing something different because it's not been done before. Second, this is a definition I use a lot, and I think this would be kind of where I would land uh, on my definition of game changer is a leader who thinks differently. And, and actually what, <clears throat> what I was doing with the teaching this weekend would have landed on this first one right here, on thinking differently. And, and I have, we might, we might get to some of it, but... That, that, to me, is where game changers begin. You have to think different. And you have to explore continuously. It's amazing to me as I travel the world, the people who have the best churches, large churches, most progressive churches, ask the most questions. The people with the pitiful churches who need to ask questions only tell you what they're doing. They don't ask any questions. And so a person who explores, a person who learns, a person who learns from everybody, if you don't learn what to do, you learn what not to do. Explore, read, right. think. Talk, look at people. Even if you don't like them as a person, learn from them. Yes, yes. Even if you disagree with one part of them, try to learn from a part that yes, you like. That's right. They break old molds, they inspire faith, and they impact the future. Now, I want to give you the characteristics of a game changer, all right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to take a couple minutes to frame this thought in so you get kind of both sides of what I'm thinking. A while back, talking 10, 20 years for sure, and even before that, Harvard had been the NBA king of the business culture forever. And so Harvard had produced more and better. Stanford was right there and a few other, their top five, but Harvard was the leader most of the time over the last couple decades. Harvard would train the NBA, they would graduate there, they have, their way of training is absolute, was, uh, uh, amazing, mind-boggling what they would do to train an MBA person. And then the tracks they would have afterward and how they would keep them up to date. But they would always have a waiting list of the companies would be putting in trying to hire their MBAs. So if you graduated from there, you would have a choice of eight to ten companies. You would have the world at your feet. And these companies would just wait and they would just get their help and they would put those people to work. And that rotation of MBAs and Harvard and along with some Stanford and others, uh, they had something going that was marvelous. But something happened a few years back where the companies, the Fortune 500 companies, quit hiring the MBAs. And so the percentage went like, if you were hiring 10, you were hiring four, then you were hiring two, and then you were hiring one, and then you were hiring none. And so Harvard, uh, being who they are, you know, a research organization uh, and their professors, they hired a task force to actually find out what was going on. And it's a long story. It would take me 30 minutes to frame it in a lot better because it's kind of a fun, I think, insight to what happened here. But uh, what they did, they researched it all, and they went to all the different companies, they questioned everybody, and they came back and they summarized all the research and basically what they said was this. The companies are saying they're not gonna hire our MBA people anymore because they're only trained in what used to be. Marketing, structuring, hiring, functioning, authority, how they function in the office, where they function, Everything they did was simply a carryover for the last 50 years. 
And so they used the same ingredients. And one company said, we hired your MBA. We brought him in. We paid him big money. We gave him a lot to spend. He was over the marketing. This was his area. And he ruined our com company. We almost went bankrupt because he so missed the culture. He does not understand the culture. He doesn't understand today's global market. He doesn't understand the way people think. He doesn't understand gender. He doesn't understand the, the value of the dollar. And he doesn't understand teams. He doesn't build any teams around him. He's a loner up in the office, which used to be kind of those people. He says, it's not working for us, and we're, we're just not going to hire. So Harvard went back to work and said, OK, um, are, what are you going to do then? They said, we're, gonna, we're going to raise up our own. H have you tried that? This is like they had for five, seven years tried it. Said, yes, we have. And what's the result? Not good. Why is it not good? Because we don't know how to find the right person to raise up. It, it's a brand new thing. We never had to find that person. We never had to raise them up. And so we make a lot of mistakes. And so Harvard went to work with the executives. And they did thousands of hours of research and talking and, and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they came up for the companies, for Harvard serving the companies now. They said, OK, let's not go with Harvard MBAs. We got it. Let's go with companies raising up who you need. Got it. And we're going to help you do that. And so they structured. And they said, we've done our research. And we have come up with what we call a game changers genetic code. And I'm going to give it to you. They came up with 12 identifiable identifiable characteristics of a game changer that would change your company. And they said, if you're going to train people, find these 12 characteristics, because these are genetic codes. If they have these, they will definitely be buildable, and they will go further than anybody else. And so they created a whole thing. Another uh, teaching would be on acceleration pools. What are acceleration pools? It's where you take the potential game changers. You're not sure they are. But you put them into an acceleration pool, and you try to accelerate their growth, accelerate their thinking, and see where they land. And then you sort out. If you have six of those guys, you might only end up with two that actually have these characteristics. But you have to have a way to find the, the campus pastor. You have to have a way to find the worship pastor. You have to have a way to find people that are going to have broader in influence and build the whole organization and where do these people come from and how do you find them what should they look like here's the 12 things they came up with one they said these people are very strategic two they are big picture thinkers they don't think just from a department or from their own little world they're big picture thinkers they've trained their thinking number three they are a creative idea generator if you get around them and their teams, they are the generator. They, they, not that they are the most creative people, that they will bring it out of people. They will get the creative people to come forward. And when they find those people, they really pump out the creative ideas. They're creative generators. They know how to get what they need for. They're obsessive to succeed. They, they won't settle for less. They won't settle for second. They are obsessive. They will go for the best every time. They'll go for the highest every time. Five, they are great at articulating vision. And so one of the things that's interesting, in their whole research, they found that one of the biggest weaknesses of, of leaders trying to build teams is they weren't able to articulate an inspiring vision to the people they tried to gather. And so because they weren't good at articulating, they would simply use brand, and they would use statements, and they would use mission statements, which became a big deal with, with everybody. But mission statements can be deader than Julius Caesar if you don't have a person that actually owns that statement, believes in that statement, lives that statement, and it's not just a mission statement, it's a mission life, it's a mission spirit. This is who I am and this is who we are. They had a group of leaders that could not articulate that vision. Six, they had uh, people that should be a strong influencer of people. They also found that their leaders, their NBA people, the people they had used, were very administrative, but they weren't people movers. They, they understood systems and structures, but they couldn't influence people. And, and one of the things that surprised them uh, is that people did not like the leaders they chose. And so the actual leaders trying to lead were not liked by the people on the teams or the people on the staff. And that was one of the things that really got to them because they said, what do you mean you don't, we don't like them. We don't like their personality. We don't like the way they talk. We don't like the way they, they treat us. We don't even like the way they drink their coffee. We don't like them. They're, they're someone that I would never do life with. I don't want to do leadership with. I don't want to do this organization with. They're an unlikable person. They didn't care in their hiring about likability. They only cared about skill. You will miss the boat if you hire skill 
and mislikability. People have to like who they work with. All right? Seven, they're passionate about an idea, which means they don't give it up easy. If I have somebody come into my office, they have an idea, and I go, but, 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 uh, you know, why don't you think, and what about, and I'm not sure, and they say, that's fine. I had one guy that always did this to me, and he was over a large piece of the pie of the, of the campus of the church and everything up there, and he... He would bring ideas to me, and I, I would only torpedo with little torpedoes. Uh, not even big torpedoes, not mean torpedoes, not even aggressive explosive torpedoes, not atomic torpedoes, just hint torpedoes. Just kind of have you, would you, have you considered you might, you know, uh, and they would go, never mind, no, that's a bad idea. But no, it might not be a bad idea, but you, you don't ever stay with your idea. You just give it up. As soon as someone pushes, you give it up. If you're a game changer, you bite into things and you're very hard to get unbite. And if you don't like those kind of leaders, you won't have game changers around you. If you want a leader that agrees with you every time or they bring something, we, we don't do it that way. Okay, I didn't think so. You know, I just thought I'd bring it up, you know, because, you know, other, other people are doing it. Uh, no offense. I mean, I mean, really, what we're doing is fantastic. You're fantastic. Church is fantastic. Everybody is fantastic around here. And if you have that kind of a leader, all you're doing is, is, is sinking the church into the uh, yesterdays, and you don't have game changers. You don't have leaders that actually will say to you, Pastor Frank, that is not what everybody else thinks. Well, they have a right to be wrong. <laughs> I mean, I had leaders that spoke up to me. And, and they would have to back me down, and our, or I would back them down, or we would have to prove our ideas and changes. And we made big changes together. And there were some of those changes I was never on board with. I did not want to do it. But they ended up being a better decision than what I was making because they had seven more perspectives than I had. And so when you have a team, make sure the team is passionate. Number eight, the risk takers. You don't want somebody that if you give them something, all they do is park their little body on top of it and never change anything because they don't want to risk anything. You want people that will have some sort of risk. You don't want the person that risks everything and ruins everything every time. If somebody risks and they ruin the department, that's strike one. They do it strike two. The third time, I send them to work down in San Jose. <laughs> Nine, they're high on vigor, high on vigor. That is enthusiasm, and, and, and again, number nine scored so high with what they wanted with leaders, what the, what the people who work with leaders, they wanted leaders who had heart, enthusiasm, and passion for what was going on. And you think about that. Ten, likable, I've already said that. Eleven, they excel in tough times. Tough times don't kill them, they excel. And 12, this was another uh, secret bullet for them. They didn't see it, but it became a major piece of their study. Game changers take people with them. And so if they get promoted, if they, if they find a way to have their ministry or their leadership to go forward, they take people with them. They don't use their team and say goodbye. I'm going to a bigger team now, and I'm going to a bigger budget, and you guys just keep functioning over here. But thank you for helping me get to where I'm going because it's the most important thing for me to get to where I'm going, and you stay where you are because you're kind of a lesser people anyway. And really, I'm, I'm a great person. I have a lot of great talent. I don't need to be anchored to you, and you're like a ball and chain on me sometimes, but I don't I'll tell you that because it's, it's hard to work with people that don't think as smart as I think and move as fast as I move and do what I do. But you know, you're in your little world and God bless your little world. I'm going to a bigger world. People hate that person. Why? Because you're heartless, you're passionless, and you don't have the Holy Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, you take people with you. If you have holy ambition and it's all yours, you leave everybody behind. You're like the rapture. Leave everybody behind. <laughs> Just move on. Okay, now, my time is 11 o'clock. Is that right? I'm looking at my clock. How much? <laughs> Shandai Rama, Shandai Rama, Shandai Rama. Thank you, David. All right. Now that's from that one study, which I think what I just gave you is interesting and it's valuable and it's workable. Now I'm gonna give you 
another list. This is called Demazio Research List. This is, this is actually better than Harvard. I should send these to Harvard. I looked at those and I would say, okay, the 12 that I just gave you, absolutely. You know what? I've experienced almost every one of those with me and my leaders. Now I'm going to give you the 12 biblical identifiable characteristics. What actually in the scripture did God identify as a game changer? What was in them? Here's 12 things I found. One, all of them had a God encounter. The thing you want to ask people to work with you is when did you encounter God? Not when did you join the church. Encounter God. Secretaries, people that work the front door, people that answer the phones. Don't just hire the skill, hire a God encounter person because they'll be on the phone and sure enough, there's no one else available, but they can give the counsel. They can give wisdom because they're a God encounter person. And, and if they meet somebody in the forward, they don't say, oh, let me find a pastor. You know, I just answer phones here. That's all. I just answer phones here. I'm not really a Holy Spirit person. You know, I'm just, I, I, I've not been around the Holy Spirit very much. And, and you know, but, but I know how to dress. I have good shoes. You want to look at my shoes. Uh, you want a person that no matter who they are, where they work in this organization, if somebody has a need, they move into it with a God consciousness and say, I will pray for you. I will help you. And if they need a ride, you don't pawn them off. If they, if they need prayer, you don't pawn them off. If they need a small group, you don't say, go to the table and sign up. A God encounter person takes that as, wow, come to my group. You have a group? Oh, oh, oh. Do we have a group? Yeah. <laughs> and what are you doing for lunch? Uh, if you're coming with me and then we're going to small. That's what I call a God encounter person. Is that they see the value of what they're doing beyond job description and paperwork and, and organizational work. People, our organization, our thing that we're doing here is called people. That's what we are. We're a people group. All right, second adversity journeys. If you want to find a game changer, make sure they've been through enough trouble. <laughs> and I'll give you a hint. If you're going to hire one, don't hire one that hasn't been through it because then you have to go through it with them. <laughs> I want them. I want them. It's, it's the only place in the planet, it's the only place in the universe that if you've been through brokenness and you've been through abuse and you've been through bankruptcy and you've been through marriage problems and you've been through all kinds of all kinds of all kinds of life and stuff and you had a son die and you had a, a prodigal child and all you lay all that out. It's the only place in the, in the planet that Paul says in Corinthians, if you've been through that stuff, you're valuable to the kingdom of God. That's what he says. So whatever, remember this, God doesn't waste Amen. any of your problems. He never wastes a thing. So if you've been through hell and back, God says, you're my kind of person. If you've been through hell and thought, God says, keep moving, keep moving. Don't stop there. Adversity journeys. Why? Adversity is the only thing that exposes the true heart of a person. Adversity is the only thing that exposes the value of a person, the value system, the values they hold. Adversity will expose whether they're loyal or not. Adversity exposes so much. Obviously, we could teach on adversity journeys, and I could show you from all the way, from Joseph all the way through the whole Bible, the people that God uses, he put through stuff. And if the stuff doesn't kill them when they get done, then God kills them. <laughs> God wants a dead person. Someone that doesn't argue with him. Someone that doesn't reason with him. Someone who doesn't say, well, God, have you thought of this? Or, God, you know, this is a bad idea to go over the river. It's flooded. It's just a bad timing. I know you don't know agriculture, but it's a bad time to go over the river. And I think we stay on this side. God didn't like leaders he had to reason with. So he beats reasoning out of you. Pow, 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 pow. <laughs> and then when God says do it, you just go, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
Because you know if it's reasoning, God says, I'm going to take you around the mountain one more time. <laughs> okay, the people that are game changers, I'm talking to you. You encounter God big way. It means you're filled with the Holy Spirit. You speak in tongues. Forget this debate about speaking in tongues. You buy the shoes, you get the tongues. The tongues come with it. You, you need to have... I think... Whoa. Personally, this is just Frank DiMazio and you have David, but I think the church needs more of the Holy Spirit, not less. And why in the world are we embarrassed about speaking in tongues? If God was embarrassed, he wouldn't have put it in the scripture. He would have hidden it somewhere that you couldn't even find it with, a, with some kind of a metaphor or dot image in the book of Hosea. He put it right out front. So personally, I asked leaders, do you speak in tongues? Well, you know, I, I've been prayed for. I didn't, do you speak in tongues? Well, you know, I tried a couple times. Do you speak in tongues? Uh, did I offend you? It's her. I knew it. I knew it. They don't speak in tongues. I knew it. I could, I could feel it when she was up here. She's not a tongue speaker. Number three. I'm going to get through this list. They have supernatural faith. If, you, if you're going to do anything in the church, you've got to have some supernatural. I, I don't need people to tell me. If I ask a leader something and they tell me everything I know and why we can't do it, I already know that. Hello, I know that. I'm asking you, should we believe for something beyond what we know? Well, you know, Pastor Frank, that's a tough thing to do because if we fail, then it would look like we are doing something stupid if we go out to that piece of real estate and we don't did it and the church knows it and then we say it's faith and, you know, I'm just, I don't need that person to reason me out of a word. Why? Because the church is not built on good real estate agents. It's built on words from God. And you better have one. And if you don't have one, I don't think you can lead. If you don't have a supernatural faith, people say, do you have supernatural faith? Of course I do. Do you believe in healing? Yes. Why do you limp? Because God's slow. Yeah. <laughs> He's not quite caught up with me. All right, here's some more. Four, these are the game changers. They see the invisible. So they have a God encounter. They... Adversity journey, they have a supernatural angle on everything. They see the invisible. What an important person who can see the invisible because that's where everything happens, people. It's in the invisible. It's not happening in this piece of carpet. It happens in something that's invisible. I want them to understand prayer changes what's invisible. Yes. Worship might look stupid, but it changes an atmosphere in the invisible. Five, they're driven by purpose. And I would say the purpose has to be first the God purpose. Then I think second is the church purpose. Third, I think is the kingdom purpose. And then you get to have number four, personal purpose. Amen. But most people today in the churches that I hear and I, they teach everybody to find your purpose, find your gift, find what pleases you, find where you need to go. Find, I don't think so. I think you bury the treasure in the field. The field is the field of God's purpose. The treasure is something God has hidden. When you buy the field, you get your treasure, but you can't get the treasure without buying the field. Okay. I see we're going to have communion. You're going to need communion after my teaching. <laughs> Number six, a dreamer. I, I want people to dream. Not just for me, but for them and for the church and for their ministry. And number seven, I want them to have passion, a passionate leader. I mean, passion is a wonderful thing. I, I'd rather have a, uh, you know, a car that's running and the steering wheel's missing than I would have a parked car that has no motor. Right, right. That's a good parable right yeah. there. Eight, breakthrough. Amen. 
I want them to have a breakthrough attitude. We'll get through this. We'll break through. Nothing will stop. You know what? Let's go for gold. Nine, they gather great leaders. Number nine is the one on this list that I would stop. But they gather great leaders. You, you only want people that gather leaders and reproduce after their kind. But if they're reproducing Ishmael, stop them. <laughs> Ten, they're resilient. One of the greatest characteristics for leaders on your team and everybody else is you get up again. You keep fighting. Number 11, you make big things happen. Even if I give you a little piece of ground, you grow corn 20 feet high. You make big things happen. And 12, don't sacrifice too much, of course, within the priority kingdom of God, principles that you have to obey, you know, family, self, all that. But no sacrifice is too hard for you to, if you're able to see it, you will do it, you will give it. Your sacrifice and being here this morning, given a Saturday, that's a sacrifice. And there's other people that could be here, aren't here, because they won't sacrifice Saturday. And, and your other things you do with your schedule that you'd rather do something, but you have to, sacrifice is the name of the kingdom of God. That's how we build churches. That's how we build game changers. You are a game changer. You're building a game changer church. It's going to be a marvelous thing. Everybody shouted hallelujah. How many, of you, how many of you got something out of this? Yeah, good. Okay. Let me pray for you as David comes and takes this service, whoever's taking it. Why don't you stand to your feet? We'll pray. Why don't you spread your hands toward heaven? And let's just, during this great, great conference and great time, let's just give ourselves a fresh and say, you know what, that's... He's preaching about what I want to be. Oh God, here I am. Lord, I spread my hands toward heaven, believing for a mighty anointing of the Holy Spirit to come upon me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet to be a game changer right here in this city and the cities we represent. Lord, for the kingdom of God and the many campuses that will start and the missionaries that will be sent and the many hundreds of young leaders that will be raised up, the best is yet to come. You only have a glimpse of the future. You see obscurity. But what is in front of you is a magnificent painting. It's something that God is at work right now. He's putting it together. And you're in the painting. This is your time. This is your hour. Lord, anoint them. Give them wisdom. Give them the ability to respond. Lord, make this the kind of church you would be happy with. Lord, the kind of yes. cities that we can reach and build yes. thriving campuses yes. in every one of these cities. See the, the lost come back, the prodigals return, and the healings to those that are broken to come to the house of God where there's healing, a healing place, a healing flow. Lord, we right now accept this. Can you now just intercede in your spiritual tongue right now? Come on, everybody. Let's just intercede in our spiritual language right now. Come on, let that river roll. Let it roll out of you, out of your innermost being. Allow God to do a work in you. Change us, Lord, and help us to change the world. Make us game changers, Lord. Use us, Lord, use us. Use us, Lord. Use our gifts. Use our... Thank you, Lord, even for our adversities. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this place. Come on, we're going to have Holy Spirit time this morning. We're not going to be in a rush. We're going to allow God to move, have his way. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, come, Holy Spirit. Move in us, oh Lord, have your way, Lord, have your way, have your way. Oh, speak to us, Lord. Touch us, Lord. Empower us, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you. We bless your name, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, thank you. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. I'm glad the worship team is here because we just want to take the next 30, 40 minutes, whatever it is, and just kind of flow. Just have Holy Spirit time. How many just need a few minutes in His presence? Just a get scripted. I don't want to get rushed. We've come together from our five cities and we just need God. We just need, we need an Acts 13. We need the Lord to speak to us. We need to feel his presence. We need him to empower us. And hallelujah. Take, take your seats just for a moment. Let's keep the flow of sound and the last thing we do today will be, we'll take communion. Apostle C will come and we'll share communion from our different locations. Um, let me just talk from my heart before we go there <clears throat> about a few things that are uh, important to me. First of all, home run. Frank DeMazzo. I mean, Grand Slam. I could listen to him for hours. And how many would like Pastor Frank to come back? And Sharon. And how about Eric Butler, huh? So these are our friends and they're helping us um, to become what, what we're becoming. Uh, Pastor Frank talked about becoming uh, a leader, coming, in, coming into your place as a leader. And I want to just, a little housekeeping, just mention this event right here. This is the 2018 Leadership Pathways Retreat. So maybe you're here thinking, how would I become a campus pastor? How would I become a worship leader in one of our cities? How would I become an elder? How would I, I, I'm with you in the vision. Pastor David, I want to be a part of what God is doing in reaching cities. And, or maybe I'd like to be a prayer leader or a men's leader or a children's leader. I just, I feel like I have potential in my life, but what would I do? What would you do with me if I reported for duty? We've designed this event called the 2018 Leadership Pathways Retreat for uh, a Saturday and a Sunday morning for you to come join us in the Redwoods at Mount Hermon where we're just going to talk through the vision of Gateway and what we see as seven clear pathways from where you are to where God would take you to. I have a feeling this is going to fill up really fast and we might have to do it again very soon. But on this first one, we're doing it by application and you would apply to be a part of this retreat at our website online. And I'm gonna put these brochures down here and there are more in the lobby. Cause I really, I believe some of you are called to be at that event. And I want you to think about that. That's uh, December 1st and 2nd. It's actually a Saturday and a Sunday morning. I won't be here on Sunday morning, December, cause I'm gonna be up in the hills conducting a, a retreat with the next generation of leaders for our 10 cities vision. Here's the other thing I wanna mention. Having a clearly articulated vision, we heard about that. How many heard what Pastor Frank said? You gotta have a vision that's clear. We have this book and for today only, this is called Beyond Our Vision for 10 Cities. This is inspiration, but it also explains what we're trying to do. You say, Pastor David, what are you trying to do? What is this 10 cities thing? I can't talk about it all day long, every day on Sunday. So I put it in a book and it's a beautiful book. And I want this in your heart. I want it in your hands, but I really want it in your heart. I want it to resonate with you so you understand how we're gonna reach out and where we're going as a church. So for today only, I don't know, my book people, can we, can I do this? Am I allowed? I'm taking authority. For today only, Today only, this is $5, okay? It's a $15 book, but I really want, please don't get it and then put it in your drawer. I'm really asking you, you can read this in about an hour and 20 minutes. It's not a hard book, but if I could get 200 leaders to resonate with what we're trying to do and get on track, 
that would be powerful. So when we dismiss later, um, you can grab that for $5. Tell them Pastor David said it's $5, not 15 I want to recognize uh, some pastors. We're going to do some ordinations. We're going to do some special things here while we're all together. This is just Holy Spirit moment. This is just family time, all right? And I, I see all the guys ready with communion. It's going to take a few minutes, so just uh, let me do this. Thank you for, thank you for being ready. Uh, but but I, I want to begin with um, recognizing a list of... Uh, first, we're going to recognize some existing pastors. You know, Gateway's a growing family, and leaders are coming, and they're joining us, which I love. I love when people come to me and say, how could I be a part of this? So pastors are coming, and... Uh, And we want to recognize them as they become a part of our family. And they've all been ordained previously in other ways and in other places. But today it's just about saying you're a part of the family. So would the following pastors please, um, when I call your name, come and stand here on the floor level. And then Apostle C and I want to pray for you. Pastor Hank and Linda Bertolero from Gateway Modesto, would you come? Pastor Hank and Linda. Pastor Jim Cafaro and Kathy Cafaro, would you come? Pastor Jim and Kathy. Gateway Clovis. <clears throat> Pastor Stephen and Jan Wilson, just joining and becoming a part of Gateway. The former Liveheart, the former Christian community. These are great, great people, great, great people. And one of our own who years and years ago, Pastor Chris Cobb was ordained, but we want today to make sure you understand that Pastor Carol Cobb is a part of the pastoral team. So she was previously ordained, but she's coming. And these are, these are spiritual leaders in our family of churches, in our tribe. And I'm so proud of each and every one of them. And we're, or, we're kind of validating, extending their ordination that they've already had within this spiritual family. Apostle C, would you come and just say a prayer over them? And church, stretch your hands out toward them as we just formally receive them as gateway ordained. Father, we just thank you for these willing and hungry leaders that you have brought into our fellowship. Father, I pray that they're not just not wanting to be ordained for men's approval. For the Lord would say, I have ordained that you should be in my leadership position that I have given you. And I have ordained that you bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. So I'm going to bless you and I'm going to, going to equip you and I'm going to sustain you and I'm going to develop you and I'm going to make you more like me, and you're going to grow in grace and in loving, and your gift shall bless many. Father, I thank you for this interruption of the prayer, that these are going to grow into mighty men and women of God, and your anointing is going to be upon them, and they will be your hands extended. In Jesus' name, we praise you. And everybody said... Now you as a church gateway, if you will receive these as your very own leaders, say amen. Amen. Say you are our leaders. You are our shepherds. Yeah. Amen. All right. I want to ask the rest of our campus pastors, all our other gateway campus pastors, please come and, and you guys just stay right here. And the rest of our gateway pastors, if you are an ordained gateway campus pastor or pastor right here in San Jose from our campus, please join us on the, uh, on the platform here. In fact, if, if all of you guys could just come up to this platform, let's, let's do that. Let me just kind of stage this here. 
This isn't a wedding. It's just an ordination. Okay, so we're just, I don't mind being, I don't mind being a little, yeah, I don't need that. You can take that. I do need my papers. You can take the rest of that. Thank you. Hallelujah. I'm so happy today. I got to tell you how happy I am. I love every single one of you. I'm so excited that we get to do this all together. And I'm so excited that you are on this team. Are you happy you're on this team? Hallelujah. Somebody says, how's your church doing? I say, it's not my church. First of all, this is the Lord's church, but it's your church. Everybody say, my church. Gateway is one church in, in multiple locations, and we're one, one family. I believe this is a prophetic moment because we're going to be ordaining two very special women I have a lot of thoughts today about how God is using women around the world. And, and I'm so proud of the ordained women in our church, and we have many of them. Uh, but we're going to be adding two more that have never been ordained before. And they're very special to me and very special to you. They're people that you love very much. And uh, this morning we're going to be ordaining Carrie Stewart. And and Delgado. Yeah. <laughs> Carrie, um, I've known her since she was 19 years old. She's been my assistant for years and years and years, but she has taken on a greater and greater role. And God is using Carrie with the young professionals, and she is a rock star with... Um, operations. She's on staff. And in fact, you ought to say thank you to Carrie because she did this whole conference together with our team. She put the whole thing together. And so Carrie, would you come just, just stand right behind me? And let me tell you about Ann Delgado. Ann is, uh, been serving in our online she's she's really our online pastor but also over our service teams and Anne is taking on a greater and greater role as connections so Anne's being ordained as connections pastor and online pastor which is very special we've got a lot of vision for online we have we have so many plans to reach out through the tools that God has given to us and Anne is a big part of that of course her husband Hip is an amazing guy. Don't cross hip. You don't want to mess with him. <laughs> He'll leg sweep you. Uh, but Anne is very, very special. Anne, where are you? Come up, please. Where are you, Anne? Please come at this time. All right. <clears throat> I'm not supposed to turn my back to you, but I'm going to just so I can talk to these ladies for a minute just say a few words I'm very proud of both of you you've both been super faithful you have great character your members your leaders of gateway you've proven yourselves as a blessing you're healthy in your relationships that to me is the most important thing you live a clean life you live an example an exemplary life you've served in ministry you're cooperative submissive you are givers not takers you're spiritually prepared gifted but you're also practical you're not so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good you get things done and you minister to people and you help your game changers I would say it that way you've been faithful over time and our overseers our board our pastors myself Kathy and I we have no doubt that ministry is your lifetime calling. In other words, though you could do other things and you would succeed, in my mind, you're useless for anything other than building the body of Christ. And that's your, that's your, that's your orbit. That's your, your wheelhouse. And you came to us over 10 years ago. And I, I saw both those natural sides and spiritual sides in your life, detailed, conscientious, faithful, um, you get it done. 
I said to you several years ago, maybe five years ago, one day you're going to be called Astor, Pastor Ann. Do you remember I said that to you? I saw that people, because you go after people. You go after the hurting. Do you know what our church is about? Our church is about people. It's not about, I mean, I like org charts and getting things done and all of that, but if you're going to be a pastor, you got to love people and you got to go after people and you got to care. And, and Anne does that. And I really appreciate that. Your shepherd's heart, you love people, you connect them and, and you help them connect into their calling. You help them find their gift. And that's very important to Jesus. It's very important to me. You're being ordained as a pastor in the online ministry, Connections Pastor team leader, and I know you're going to succeed. You're already succeeding. Thank you for everything you bring to uh, our ministry. We deeply love you, respect you a lot. Carrie Stewart, you've been a part of this family for over 20 years. First as a young girl, then as a 19-year-old bride, then as a young mom, then as my assistant, then as a church plant helper, then as a sudden widow, then as a growing minister, and now and for years, a vital part of our team. I've seen your faithfulness, your loyalty, your easy nature. Kathy and I love that about you. Your class, your humor, your people skills, that's so important. Now the Lord is using you with young professional women. You're a gift to this house. You're being ordained as a pastor in young professionals, but also in operations because you're living to build the church with me and with our team. And I know that you're going to be fruitful and succeed in everything you set your hand to do. I love both of these ladies. They are loved. Now in, in traditional churches, ordinations might involve a series of uh, traditions, <laughs> charges, readings, vows. We're just not that, but, but we are Holy Spirit people, and we believe that this is a God moment. How many believe this is a God moment? So let me just say this as we, as we do this. First, this is a sacred moment. It's a, ordination is an official recognition and authority uh, within vital roles within the church. We have licensed ministers, but ordained pastors is something different. It's something very, very special. And so there's a, a level of authority. There's a level of um, responsibility there. It is a spiritual impartation. It's not an empty ceremony. It's a God, it's a God thing. Second, it's a scriptural thing. We know that Paul laid hands on Timothy and there was impartation that took place and there was a setting aside What's going to happen here as we lay hands on them is not just a ceremonial. It's, it's actually an impartation of life and anointing. And I've, I've actually I brought some oil today. I'm going to I'm going to anoint them with oil to symbolize a Holy Spirit impartation that's taking place. And I want you guys to help me with that. And finally, this moment is about servanthood. Ordination is not about title, although. In our church, in our culture, we'll be happy to refer to them as Pastor Ann, Pastor Carrie. That's, that's a good thing. But this is about servanthood. Your life as an ordained minister is to serve, to give. And, um, and that's what you're all about. This is not a right. This is not an entitlement. This is not, I've served X number of years, and so I've earned this. This is about servanthood, sacrifice. It's a, it's a huge responsibility because as you serve well, Jesus is glorified and our Savior is represented. If you would neglect your calling, neglect your responsibility, you would damage the name of Christ. It's a huge responsibility. In the church, ministers' mistakes are magnified and sometimes their good qualities go unrecognized. Everybody just expects a pastor to be amazing all the time. And if they're amazing, no one says anything. But if they make a mistake, everybody's talking about it. But that's servanthood. That's the job. <laughs> 
And that's not our culture, but I'm so proud of the way you carry your servanthood role. It's not about privileges and rewards. It's about responsibilities and burdens. And to all of our pastors, it's a good reminder. What we're signed up for is not the accolades. We're signed up for serving. Can I have an amen? Yeah. So I ask you this, Ann and Carrie. And when I ask these questions, you will answer, by God's grace, I will. By God's grace, I will. Ann and Carrie, will you uphold the truths of God's word and scripture as taught in this house? Will you be a living example of Jesus Christ in this church and in this community, a model of integrity, devotion, and faithfulness in your family, finances, and personal conduct? Will you be faithful in your assigned duties and loyal to those who are over you in the Lord? Will you seek to serve with a humble heart and mind, leaving the rewards to God alone? Will you earnestly seek God's best for his people in prayer and in your labors, and most especially those in this spiritual family? I believe you. I do. To the church, I would say these women have been set apart by God for ministry in our church. They need your support. They need your affirmation. Do you promise before God that you will pray for them? By God's grace, do you promise that you will encourage them as they serve the Lord and as they serve you? Will you support them as they minister to their families first? And will you cooperate with them as representatives of our leadership and of the Lord Jesus Christ? If so, say amen. Thank you very much. We're ready for the laying on of hands. Apostle C, we're going to lay hands. And if you'll take, will you take point and pray because I want to use my oil and anoint them. And then if you guys will all stretch your hands toward them. And some of you here, if you can reach them, let's lay our hands on them. And let's, let's do what the Bible says. Let's impart. Amen. How about the audience, the congregation? Why don't you point your hand towards them? They're as they're being ordained. Ordained means the point. <laughs> and the word of the Lord unto you, my daughter, you have been TP'd. You have been through the fire. You have been through the storm. You have been through the loss. You have uh, had tears just in, in plenty of measures, and your heart has been right towards me in all of the sorrows and trials. You've been tried and proven, TP. And so the Lord would say unto thee, this is the beginning now of a further growth process. Creator, greater is the days ahead. More strength as more uh, passionate open doors in this church for ministry. Yeah. You are going to be anointed to do it. Yeah. You will be met with uh, wisdom beyond your years. And you can count on me that I've been faithful this yeah. far yeah. and I will be That's faithful right. unto yes. the end. And you give up a praise and an honor and the glory to your Lord. I am pleased with you, saith the Lord. You too have been through the trials and the storms. and You never felt that you'd ever be at this point in time in your life. But I saw in you a heart that loved and longed for my presence and my lordship. And you were willing to surrender to my will and purpose you're going to be fruitful <laughs> you're going to bring forth fruit even more so in, in the year uh, 
2019 than this year. You are going to see increase anointing, increase ability to even prophesy and to speak comfort and assurance. And you're going to see people with uh, vexations and burdens and fears and complexities find release because of the love and compassion that oozes out of you. I'm going to bless your bread and your water and take sickness away from you, says the Lord. Wonderful. If there's any joy in me, if there's any anointing in me, whatever grace is on my life and Kathy's life, our lives as leaders, we impart it to you now. The heart of God, the DNA of this church, responsibility and authority, we release it to you now and charge you in the sight of God and in the presence of these people to fulfill the call of God in your life and to build the church of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. We proudly recognize you today as ordained pastors. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, ushers, guys, take a seat. We're going to have special communion together. What a chance for us to just enjoy God's presence. Can we worship the Lord a little bit? I don't know exactly what's going to happen next, but I think it'd be good to worship and just go back into God's presence. And uh, so go ahead and serve as we're, as we're worshiping, and then we're going to take communion in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, God, we yield to whatever you want, God. Mold us, make us, Father. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil, I now surrender. breaking new ground
about that new wine. Hallelujah. Apostle C, come on and stand with me. Just before he prays, uh, and I believe, you know, Apostle C's got a lot in him. He's got a lot to say and a lot to bless. How many of you believe in a father's blessing? Yeah, that's him. He's going he's gonna to share that. But one of the things that's so important as we come to the Lord's table is the, the recognition of one another, you know, that we are the body of Christ. And we're not five different churches. We're one church. Even if, you, even if you're from another church outside of Gateway, we have many friends here today. We're still one. We're still one. Sometimes offenses can come up hurts, you know, like any family. I mean, I, I tell you, I've hurt my wife before, and I love her a lot. And once in a while, every 10 or 20 years, she hurts my feelings, and <laughs> she's pretty perfect. The, the point is, even when you love and live for each other, you can still step on each other's toes. It can happen. This would be the time to let go of any offenses, any hurts, any bruise any myth you know that that you have because we're going to march out of this room and we got a lot of work to do and we're going to do it together would you be willing to drop hurt feelings and offenses and would you be willing to let go of stories about each other and thoughts about each other and judgments about each other and opinions about each other and just can we just be family and just say you know what I, you got a big wart on your nose but you're still my man all right you just you know I love you, warts and all. That's how we love. That's important. And uh, the other thing is that, it's, that God does want to connect us even stronger. Prophetically, I believe he wants to just connect us. And maybe as a sign of that connection, we could just exchange our cup. Take, take 60 seconds and find two or three people. And just as an act of unity, would you give them your cup, receive their cup, then maybe... Let's just kind of mingle it up a little bit here so we really understand. There's one cup, one body, one... Oh, you guys didn't get served? Oh. I would love it if the worship team could get served. Let's get... Can we get somebody up here to serve the worship team? Bread and wine, if they're able, between guitar strings. Because you're part of the family. I'm symbolically, imaginarily exchanging cups and can you say to somebody next to you I honor you as my brother as my sister yeah yeah, yeah we're one body that's right yeah we're just family I believe we're ready for the blessing of the Lord on the screen will be a scripture to show you how in sync all the speakers, including Pastor David just now. The scripture about communion is the cup of blessing that we bless. Is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread Shout that. One bread. One bread. One. And that's the theme of this conference. One bread. <laughs> and we break it. As we break it, it is, is it not, another question, a participation in the body of Christ? I must just add this. You cannot be a Christian and not be in the body of Christ. It's impossible. So if you're in the body of Christ, and I'm in the body of Christ, hey, we're in the same family. We're one. We're one. We're one. And then, look what it says. Because there's one bread. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. No Baptist, no Methodist, no Lutheran, no Catholic, no Charismatic. We are one bread. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One bread. And I just want to say this. This will be my probably 80th communion. Seven of those, I've been in full-time ministry. 
And I want to tell you from my heart, and God is listening, and I want you to be able to say the same thing. I am proud I'm a part of the body of Christ. I love this song. I'm so glad I'm a part of the body of Christ. Washed in the blood, filled with the Spirit. The body of Christ, the church, it's my life. It's my life. I, I could not be happy if I wasn't a part of the body of Christ. And so, Father, as we partake, as it were, spiritually speaking, the body and the blood of Jesus, and we bless the bread and we bless the cup, and as we partake of it, we're not just going to a ritual or a form it's not a litany. It's more than that. There is power in the blood of Jesus. And there's power in the body of Jesus. And there is power to deliver, to set free, and to heal. And Father, as we partake of it, let us really ask for your forgiveness of any offense any unrepented of or unapologized offense, we're not going to drink unworthily. Lord, we've all misbehaved and we've all come short. And now, Lord Jesus, we want to put that back, far back, and fill us, oh God, with compassion and love and forgiveness and acceptance and appreciation of one another. Give us deep concerns and care for everyone that's hurting and everyone that's weak. We thank you, Father, for what you did in sending your only begotten son to die. Satan didn't kill him. You, you sent him to die. It was your will for him to die. But you brought him back. And now, by this life, through this communion, we are experiencing resurrection and strength and new life. And we thank you. Bless the bread and the cup. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The cup represents the blood that cleanses from all sin. If Satan reminds you of some of your past, you remind him that you have no past. It's been it's been removed by the blood of Jesus. And as you drink, you drink wholeness. You drink sanctification and purification because you've committed every part of your life to the Lordship of Jesus. Let's drink. that um, the Lord wanted me to tell you, Pastor, that um, when Pastor Frank was ministering, it just kept rolling over and over and over again in my mind that you're to train leaders, one level, to train leaders, two levels, to train leaders. It's a three-dimensional thing that uh, God has called you to do, and we'll tell you why. Because I saw the wineskin of this house being stretched again. And it was, he pulled it. I mean, he stretched it much further than what you may have thought uh, in your initial vision uh, for what you wanted to do with this house and with the people. And he stretched it far. He stretched it so far that it became uh, like it looked like plastic. You could see right through it, but it covered a vast amount of territory, geographical territory. And the Lord says, not only five, because I'm blessing you because you've been faithful with two and now five and I'm going to give you ten but the Lord says there'll be another ten listen to me and another ten and another ten and another ten 
and another 10. It'll be 50 churches that this wineskin will touch one day. And that is why the conferences and all of what you're doing is so prophetic and strategic at the same time. You already are, are, are in an apostolic prophetic vein in your choices and in the development of the house. And the Lord says, son, you're doing well. And he says to tell you that these men and women, that they're going to come in rank so fast that I just seen a, an assembly line of leaders just coming and being trained and like soldiers and they're processed properly. They're not going to be weak. There's not going to be things missing. There's going to be a full, uh, complex training uh, method to develop people, but they're going to come in ranks. And the Lord says also that one of the ways it's going to happen, I saw many churches. It was a strange picture because there were pastors, more pastors, and they were taking off their crowns. Their crowns were dented and bent, and they were taking off their crown. They were going like this, and they were saying, take me in. And there's going to be more pastors that are going to, they're coming to a revelation and a realization that what they've tried to do, uh, they've come to the end of that moment in, in their lives, and they need something greater. And they're going to turn churches over to you. Listen to me very carefully. There's going to be at least 10 more pastors within the next three years that are going to actually say, uh, I want to come under this skin. I want to come under. They're going to come under this umbrella of yours, at least 10 more. They're going to be from all. I see uh, two are Asian. Two are going to be from uh, Philippine pastors, Chinese. I see uh, one, one group is going to be led by an Indian from India. Uh, man of God, say, take us in. Uh, some African Americans, you're going to see a wide diversity, and, and two of them will be from the Latin flavor, the Mexican flavor, and you're going to see them come, and they're going to say, just let us be a part of it. And as soon as they touch the skin, all of what this house breathes, brings, is going to touch their lives, and they will come back to life. Many of them will have, listen to me, they're, go, they're going to come with, to you with marriage problems. It's going to be one of the reasons why they're going to be willing to take their crowns off. Some of them are going to have financial debt, financial debt, financial debt. It's going to be huge, overwhelming. They're just going to say, they're going to say I can't get out of it. I don't know what to do, uh, but uh, maybe you can help me. And the Lord says to tell you in this house, he's going to provide miracle finances for you to help them get out of debt. And there'll be, there'll be a transference of the coat, of the coat that this house wears. And it didn't just start with you. It's a generational coat. Uh, I see three, four, four generational coat that has been passed and is stretching its wings wide. And for you that are leaders coming up in the house, pastors, campus pastors, this is going to touch you also in a special way uh, and even beyond. It's just going to keep stretching and begin to move forward. And God says that you're going to also be a part of the leaders that train leaders that train leaders for this generation, says the Lord. Amen. Can I say something to, the, to this lady here? Uh, Carrie, right? I was going to just tell you this tomorrow, but I might as well do it today. Just come in, into the light. <laughs> but I, I, I saw on you a strong anointing. You're definitely a, a sharp as they come. If you helped me all the couple of weeks in preparing to come here. But God says also, I'm going to use your mouth. And I'm going to use you to preach the gospel. And I saw a, a, a preacher's mantle with the spirit of revelation wisdom. I see a, a fresh prophetic coat that's going to fall on you. You're going to prophesy. You're going to be a part of the prophetic teams of this house. I even see you being a part uh, with Pastor Kathy of sh uh, shaping the lives of many women. But also what I saw is God using you to write books. There's a great gift of authorship in your hands. And the Lord says, you're going to write much material for me. And you're going to write much material that people will take and uh, purchase. And they're going to be used as, as uh, uh, methods. They're going to be used as, as uh, models for their ministry, not only administratively, not only operationally, but even spiritually. In one of the books that you'll write, the Lord says, I want you to write your testimony and your story. And I'm going back to it when you were about eight years old and God began to move on your life about eight years old all the way through and how every season of your life was critical and transformational. Everything that's happened, God says he wants that story to get out. It's going to touch many people's lives. And I see you being a part, a 
uh, in the days to come of uh, a team of women that will be raised up here. Powerful women of God. Powerful women of God. Powerful women of God. Powerful women of God. They're going to preach, teach. There's going to be many conferences and many places that your name will be uh, on the billing. Your name will be uh, in the lineup because I'm going to speak through you. And many women are going to fall into your arms and cry and say, I went through the same thing. So you've not told it all. You've held a lot of it back. And you've not told the depths and the realities of the, the struggle and the pain that's in the story. But God says, I knew, I've known it all. And as even as Pastor Frank said, you're one of those leaders that has been through something. So you've been proven, you've been processed, and you've been prepared for this hour, says the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's worship. We're going to sing. We're going to go out singing. Don't go anywhere. we got to just worship five more minutes, and then we'll, we'll come back and close it out. God bless you. Let's worship the Lord. So I feel God. Make me your vessel. Come on, let's stand. Make me an offering. Every voice. Make me whatever you want me. Yes, Lord. Let's raise our voice one more time and give him your best praise. Give him your best praise for today, yesterday. It's been an awesome couple days. Amen. Well, we're going to close this chapter here this morning, but yet how many know we got some marching orders? We've got a story to tell. We're going to go out through the doors here and things are going to be changing. Everybody, everybody say game changer. And you know what? I just want to take a moment. Pastor David, I want to thank you for this conference and for us having the opportunity to be a part of it. That all the volunteers, everybody, but let's just give it up for Pastor David, the game changer in our house. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Frank, Pastor Eric, all the campus pastors. Hey, everybody from all the different drive safe, but take home that anointing that you took here with teams. Listen, we still have team books out there. Make sure, grab a couple more. Take it back home. Start some team groups. Get, get talking about what, because there's an anointing on this book. Also, out on the live, we have the Pathway brochure. Go get that. Get signed up December 1 and 2 for leadership development. You heard the word from Pastor Eric Butler on leadership. What's going to happen here? Be a part of it. Hey, listen, we have our cafe open. We got lunch over there. If you want to go over and get some of the people, hang out together. You don't have to leave here for a while. The doors are going to be open. So let's just continue to, to uh, uh, overflow in this fellowship here and uh, be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen.
God bless you.